So where is Yay. You are, uh, yes, Robert Chatham is Chapman. It's Chapman. Yes. Ch Chapman. 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 Chatham, Chatham area. Oh, is we had Van. And Chapman, Chapman is Rodney and his family. Okay. Um, but you are in for a treat today because Rodney comes to us from Forward Pinellas. Um, and, if, and I think it's a couple years now. Uh, Forward Pinellas, um, the MPO combined with the uh, Pinellas Planning Council and put land use and transportation together. And so this idea of formation of our county and cities um, and the way that we put those two things together makes a huge difference in, the, in how our transportation system is used. And so Rodney is an expert on the transportation land use connection. And so he's gonna talk a little bit today about site development and how this fits into what you all are doing in terms of the track star award so i think it fits nicely with the conversation later today as well thank you uh, cassandra um i guess i'll start off by saying uh i'm sort of i feel like i'm returning the favor because gloria and bob came to our planners advisory committee a couple months ago and talked to uh, a lot of the planning directors from around the county about what this committee is doing in terms of the star award and uh, received, they were well received by the land use planners uh, here in Pinellas County. So uh, when I was offered the opportunity to come talk to you about uh, local government uh, site or development plan uh, processes, I jumped at the opportunity because I, I think you guys are having covered something that I think is a, is a huge uh, issue as Pinellas County redevelops and what you are working on I think is a key solution to improving transit accessibility for uh, those that uh, take public transportation on a daily basis. I've tried to keep the presentation relatively um, simple in layman's terms, but if I start to talk in planner gobbledygook, <coughs> uh, please stop me and uh, ask me to clarify um, what some of this information means. But what I'm trying to do in a, in a simplistic way is to help you understand the development review process and then how it relates to what your mission, one of your missions uh, are in terms of uh, improving that transit accessibility. Uh, just a little bit about me, in addition to what Cassandra said uh, earlier, which were very kind words, I don't know if I'm an expert, <laughs> but uh, I've been doing this for uh, quite a while, and early in my career, I was primarily a land use planner, so development review, uh, site planning, those sorts of things was what I did on a daily basis and work with developers and engineers and architects to bring um, projects to our elected leaders uh, to um, impact the community that I worked for. Uh, in the latter part of my career, I've uh, kind of moved over to more transportation uh, work and uh, with the merging of the planning council as, uh, with the MPO, as Cassandra mentioned, I, I kind of feel like I'm a bridge between those two worlds. And, and I think uh, Cassandra will probably remember when we were presenting down in West Palm Beach, I talked about myself as being part of the problem. <laughs> in, in terms of sitting at the table, looking at these development or site plan projects and not making the, the, the connection to pedestrian, bicycle, transit accessibility, because in my experience, I've found that there is a negotiation that happens when uh, there is a site plan that is submitted for approval and a lot of times if there's a nexus between what the need is and what the developer is doing you can get that as part of the overall package at no, no cost to the local government really so um, I like to think I'm not trying to fix or solve things be part of the solution and so for the next few minutes I'll just talk to you about uh, the planning process, what types of projects require a site or development plan, because not everything will require uh, a site plan to be filed. I'll talk about what those elements are, as well as what those approval processes can be, because they do vary based on the local government. Uh, because we have 25 local governments here in Pinellas County, and not all of their processes are the same. So what works in St. Petersburg doesn't necessarily apply or work in Largo, uh, for example. And then just lastly, finish up with some ideas on how to improve uh, access for transit riders. So in a nutshell, uh, the site or development plan review process is geared towards ensuring that when sites are developed, buildings are constructed, that they are in compliance with local comprehensive plans, 
with land development regulations and other standards or policies that the community may have adopted. Uh, the scope of the review is pretty broad. It, it, uh, you look at things like utility, uh, access, uh, street stormwater management, parking, how ve uh, vehicles will circulate throughout a site, uh, landscaping, uh, lighting, signage. There's a, there's a whole host of things that are looked at uh, when you uh, are conducting a site plan review. We, the local government I worked at, we had a 27 item checklist. And so uh, if any one of those 27, uh, 27 items were not in compliance with the city's code, then we went through uh, some revisions with the applicant. Uh, and then lastly, some communities actually take it a step further and they have architectural guidelines or a compatibility standards. So they are looking at how the building uh, is uh, fit and finished, how it relates to the other structures within the same area and so on. So there is, like I said, there is a broad scope and a broad reach when it comes to development review of planning. Uh, here in uh, Pinellas County, as I mentioned before, it's varied. Not everything requires a site plan approval. Typically, though, uh, residential projects over a certain uh, threshold will require the submission of a site plan. Uh, where I used to work, it was three units or more uh, would require a site plan uh, to be filed. So you could do a duplex, a single family home, and that was typically an over-the-counter building permit. So a lot of the transit, accessibility, pedestrian things wouldn't be triggered because that's really an administrative process. But your commercial and industrial projects will typically require a site plan to be filed and then something we call adaptive reuse uh, typically will require a site plan as well. And what that is, is you're taking an existing building, and you'll see this a lot around Pinellas County because we don't have a lot of vacant and developable land but we do have a lot of older buildings. And so what will happen is a new user will want to go into an existing building and they will have to uh, prepare that building for the new use and typically that will require a site plan because the use of the building is changing. Sometimes your parking standards will be changing as well and that triggers essentially for that, that site to now be brought up to current code. Uh, I have the image here uh, as part of the uh, presentation because this is actually 70th Avenue in Pinellas Park and you can see that there are as you can see uh, this is a relatively new uh, townhome subdivision uh, that was really a redevelopment project this parcel used to be something else uh, but as it cycled out through the end of its useful life it was picked up by a developer and converted to a residential subdivision you see the housing stock to the right and uh, to the south is typical single family uh, that we have a lot here in Pinellas County and then intensive commercial here over to the left. So what Pinellas County really is in by and large is redevelopments. A lot of projects like this where you have uh, either adaptive reuse or redevelopment of uh, existing sites or buildings into other uses. And that is again an opportunity to improve site accessibility. Uh, so there are several elements that go into the pre preparation of a site plan, and I'll quickly walk through, uh, walk through a scenario with you. But essentially, it starts with a piece of property, and I'll try to give you an example over to the right. But these site plans are prepared by a professional engineer. They typically work with others. It's not just one person as architects. Sometimes there will be planners or attorneys, arborists, a whole host of folks that are looking at how do they make this site do what they want it to do and still meet the local government uh, plan, uh, standards and regulations. Sometimes there's a pre-application meeting uh, where we sit down with them and talk about some complex issues and uh, especially if the project can be controversial then there will be uh, that first step. Um, the foundational document of the site plan really is, starts with a survey. It's prepared by a uh, professional land surveyor. It really gives you an indication of where your property boundaries are and what that building envelope is because the survey was, is going to identify any encumbrances such as easements that limit the buildable area of a piece of property. I'll give you an example of what that looks like over to the right. Uh, the next primary step in, in that site planning process are setbacks. So each piece of property, 
Pinellas County has a zoning district that's associated with it and a set of uh, setbacks or how close or far away from property lines can a building be. And I give you an example, uh, 10 feet in the front, five on the sides and 30 feet in the rear is a pretty standard uh, set of setbacks. And you can have uh, variances to these standards based on certain hardships, but um, that again varies by community. The second step really is to look at how, as we talked about earlier, Gloria, how vehicles will access the site. So um, in this example, uh, there's two vehicle access points. Typically in an interior lot, uh, the codes will allow for you to have one vehicle access point. Uh, if you're on a corner lot, then you get uh, two, sometimes three, but that's sort of, that's being more discouraged these days. Um, some codes on the bottom access point require that the, the uh, driveway be perpendicular to the uh, adjacent roadway. So, and that is a good thing because you can see in this example, the crossing distance is typically shorter. Also, there'll be a regulation of how wide that driveway can be. I can tell you over my career, it's getting better in terms of shortening that pedestrian crossing because earlier in my career, driveways were very wide and there was no recognition that um, the wider you make that crossing, the, the less safe it is uh, for a pedestrian and bicycle. <coughs> so communities are being more careful about what that maximum width is. But then others up to the top, you'll see that it's not perpendicular and so if it's not perpendicular and you don't have a tight width standard, then you can get a very large crossing distance for these driveways. Um, and again, local governments will have engineering or access management standards that regulate where these can be, how wide they can be, and how many you can have. Uh, then um, another consideration is off street parking. And uh, in my opinion, this is probably the major barrier when it comes to transit accessibility from the transit stop to the principal entrance of a building or destination. Uh, but it is something that really drives uh, the site plan because um, my experience has shown, uh, I've learned that um, the end user, if it's a, a chain retailer or a big box store or some other uh, national uh, company, they have standards for how many parking spaces they need to have for a particular size prototype store. Uh, and so if they can get the right amount of parking on a site, then everything kind of moves on from there. And their, their parking ratios aren't necessarily what the local government will have set forth in their regulations. Uh, sometimes the, the, these end users actually require more parking than what the local government will have. Uh, in their codes. What we're starting to see, at least some, at least being discussed, is this idea of minimum, or excuse me, maximum parking. So right now most codes will give you a minute, like a floor. So you will have to have, based on the square footage of a building or number of seats in a restaurant, you'll have a minimum number of spaces that you have to provide. But what that does is it has a whole lot of unintended consequences. One is very, is it a very inefficient use of land. Uh, it, it, it increases your stormwater management requirements because you're creating a more impervious surface. You're not really creating compact, mixed walkable uh, destinations when you have four, 45 or 50 parking spaces. And so communities now are starting to look at parking maximum. So putting a cap on the number of parking spaces for uses and if if this gains traction, then it would help that parking field between the right of way and the building become a better condition for uh, transit uh, users. And then there's other elements, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I wanted to highlight a couple things. Uh, one is the site landscaping and internal pedestrian circulation, as well as offsite improvements. As the site plan comes together, uh, these are two opportunities for local governments to ensure that the area between the sidewalk and the principal entrance of the building is treated properly. Um, in this example, if I can show it to you, the area, what you see in here is pretty much a, a landscaping plan sheet of an overall site plan. A site plan is most likely typically about 10 to 15 sheets, 24 by 36 inches in size. And so 
the, the landscaping plan will show you uh, the trees, obviously, but it also show you the other improvements. So not only the building, but then the sidewalk along the public frontage shows the parking lot. Stormwater is over here to the right. It shows the internal pedestrian circulation. So in this example, you'll see there's a sidewalk that runs on the back of the building, but also uh, an interest, an entrance here uh, connected to that public frontage sidewalk as well as one here. So if your standards and regulations are uh, calibrated, calibrated correctly, you will end up with this sort of condition where you have good pedestrian access, the parking is not the most prominent feature in the building, and uh, it's an overall uh, better site for a uh, dense walkable destination. So in terms of process, as I mentioned before, it varies. Uh, it's either a public hearing process or an administrative process where staff at the local government level can approve uh, the project. Typically, larger communities have more of an administrative process. Uh, so depending on certain thresholds, so for example, uh, Pinellas County has a pretty much complete administrative process for site plan approval. So it never goes to the Board of County Commissioners uh, under most conditions. City of St. Pete has um, a similar approach depending on uh, the size of the development, <coughs> not exceeding certain thresholds. But your small to medium sized communities generally employ almost exclusively a, a, a public hearing process. And the reason that's important is because, I meant, as I mentioned before, sometimes when projects go before elected officials, there is a negotiation that occurs. And through that negotiation, cities and their leaders can sometimes uh, negotiate additional improvements uh, that are related to safe pedestrian access and other, um, other goals and objectives of the community. Um, and as I just uh, have shown here, there's just less flexibility in the administrative process because a lot of times what the developer or other group will ask is, you know, show me in the code where it says I have to do this. And if you don't have it in the code, then you're sort of stuck because uh, there are applicants do have property rights and what you want to make sure is what you're doing um, consistent with with those rights. Um, another key point in the process is once the site plan is put together and submitted to the local government for approval, there is a, a large committee of uh, key staff that review the site plan for consistency with the city's standards and regulations. Typically, that's a development review committee or a technical review committee. It um, consists of all the disciplines there. And the reason I put that there is because what we're seeing here recently in the last year or so is that the Department of Transportation has been participating in some of the larger communities' development review committee meetings. And what they're looking at is things like access management, any offsite improvements, any mitigation. And it's actually a good thing because they're dealing with some of these issues early on in the planning process. So it's not like it goes through the look over the process and gets approved and they have to go circle back with DOT to try and figure out uh, some of the site and access management issues. So DOT in some instances is having a seat at the table at that first level of review. And um, not that PST has the staff to do that, but you know perhaps that could be something that uh, could be considered. Um, here is a, an example of the actual flowchart of the approval process. I know there's a lot of shapes and a lot of colors, but the main points is uh, to get something to construction is basically two phases. So phase one is that uh, site plan review process where project goes to a development review committee, it goes through to a planning and zoning board that makes a recommendation to the elected leaders, they hear the site plan, and then they'll render a decision to approve or deny or approve of conditions. Once, and this is what that dotted line is meant to note, is once it, it completes that public hearing approval process, then it moves on to a building permit. So in this example, that public hearing process from initial submission to uh, elected leader approval was about 90 days. And then your building permit uh, was about 20 days. So um, I guess 
wanted to put some ideas out there about how to realize better uh, planned access for public transit riders. Um, and in my opinion, the most effective way to do it is to have uh, land development regulations from the local governments amended to clearly identify what it is that you want. Because if you don't have it spelled out in black and white in the code, then it's very hard for uh, the staff to sort of negotiate these improvements because sometimes, depending on um, the nature and scope of the improvement, it could cost some money. And if it's not spelled out clearly in the code, then the developer is most likely going to resist um, putting that amenity or in that improvement in the site plan. So. Uh, what you see here is section 132 from a local uh, land development code and it's dealing with sidewalks and so the first section gives you all the technical information about what the thickness is and compaction and all that but uh, down here in subparagraph D it, it talks to pedestrian access and that easements shall be required where necessary to provide access to schools parks shopping centers transportation and other community facilities pedestrian ways shall have a minimum easement of uh, width of 15 feet where easement is required and a paved walkway of six feet width. I hate to interrupt you, how new is D? I mean, I've lived here since 95, so 20 years. Is that fairly new? What we saw, okay, I've been with Fort Pinellas for four and a half years. What we saw probably um, seven or eight years ago okay. was a push through, I think it was the mayor's council. Uh, where some, I don't know who it was, but somebody presented to the mayor's council and said, we've got this pedestrian accessibility problem. So what you guys are, what your cities are doing is you're approving these site plans, but there isn't a clear, but you're, you're doing good, you're, you're requiring sidewalks to be along the perimeter of a property, but there's nothing that gets you from the perimeter to the building entrance. And so we went through a process and, and put an amendment in the code that made it clear that this is what this is the sort of treatment that we want, but from the building to the So building. eight to 10 years. Yeah, it's okay. a, and another, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm, I want to always like to be realistic with folks. I, and I, I think as planners, we don't always do a good job of explaining to the public that planning is a long horizon profession. I think Cassandra can attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time. So, you can have things in your code, you can have all the guidance and, and policy standards and such uh, that are really good, but until sites redevelop, properties turn over, these code centers don't get triggered. Um, and it's a good segue uh, to this, this next slide. Because what you see here is kind of at the top is um, what needs to happen. So this is a, a section of code that deals with uh, permits and plans required for parking lot improvement. So that's kind of the what. But subparagraph B is um, when does all that happen? Because you have all these standards, but unless you are constructing a new parking lot, expanding or reducing the current parking lot, or resurfacing, resealing, or restriping something that was different than what was originally approved or you or you're paving an unpaved parking lot none of those standards really get triggered so um, that's sort of the the reality of it is that it's an incremental process uh, I like to think about planning as a um, kind of the long game and so we can do things now but you may not see the real fruits of that that labor for maybe five or ten years um, but at least you set the context and you've set the requirements in place so as uh, projects develop, you will start to see better transit accessibility. How do we find out if our community has those in our codes? Because what you're describing right there, I can t give you two perfect examples that were not that, that long ago right. where something like that should have triggered them putting in pedestrian access and they didn't. Clearwater Mall and Whole Foods at, at Countryside Mall, when they redid that, they, there's still no way to get from the side. Well, what's good about, I can speak to Clearwater in, in general terms. Um, they, probably a year ago, not even that long ago, nine months ago, they adopted a new uh, land use plan and zoning standards for the US 19 corridor. Okay. 
Okay. So their new standard, their new standards are much better. They're much more transit oriented. They're much more focused on compact, uh, walkable uh, destinations and development. I believe that had they had that code in place, when before the Clearwater Mall redeveloped, you would see you would see a completely yeah, different yeah. because the reality is their code was not um, it was not geared towards that sort of outcome. It was it was it was geared towards what you see out there, yeah. just big parking lots yeah. and, and setback buildings and, and big box stores and, and so on. And I'll commend them as a staff because they did realize that that's sort of not the kind of development pattern they want, and so they. They went on an effort to um, essentially create a new zoning code and plan for the US 19 corridor, which uh, was unique. I also wanted to add that um, part of what we do at Fort Pinellas is we do review local government uh, land development codes because we do have some responsibility for consistency with the countywide plan. The, our scope is limited in terms of densities intensities and uses uh, so we make sure that they're consistent with, with the guidance we have but in my review of the county's land development code they have just completed a major update um, they have included <clears throat> uh, what I would call a good approach to better pedestrian connections and circulation where they are the new code requires at least one designated pedestrian pathway uh, across parking lots that now this is the the balancing act so their trigger is 50 parking spaces or more so if you have a parking lot that is less than 50 this isn't this doesn't apply but 50 or more you have to have a designated pedestrian pathway a minimum of five feet in width and provide relatively direct connection between the building entrances and all adjacent streets and shall satisfy current ADA requirements so um, as I mentioned before, I think planners across the county are starting to take a second look at their codes and see what improvements they can make to these regulatory standards to ensure that there's better uh, accessibility. Um, and to also kind of build upon your question, um, <coughs> I'm sure you've heard about Advantage Pinellas and our co-branding and kind of working with PSTA on not only our long range plan, but the community bus plan. Another element of it is the bicycle pedestrian master plan that we should be kicking off after the first of the year. And our current bicycle pedestrian master plan is, is very broad. It's very comprehensive. It's like everything in the kitchen sink. And that's a good thing from one perspective, but it's not very strategic. You don't really get a sense of what the priority um, projects would be over a time period. And also, it doesn't have a strong influence on land use planning. And so what we wanna do with uh, this next iteration of the, of the Bicycle Pedestrian Master Plan is include some technical guidance and standards for those uh, bicycle and pedestrian treatments uh, as sites go through the site plan review process. We wanna have some guidance to our local government planners as to how you should treat the area between the sidewalk and the entrance to the building. Where should bike racks be? How do other amenities factor into that, that site planning process? So while we don't have a lot of leverage uh, when it comes to our role as, uh, as on the side, planning council side of what we do, we, we do have a lot of um, influence in terms of best practices and showing all the governments that these are the things that you should be considering so that um, we're moving towards a more compact, walkable, uh, transit-friendly Pinellas County. Um, so again, that in a nutshell is what I came to talk to you about. I hope it um, was beneficial. I hope I didn't get too technical, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Anybody have any questions? My, my quick question for you is, and as, as you know, as we are you know, looking in our individual communities, <coughs> You know, is Forward Pinellas one of the resources? Like, like I know I, you know, I keep trying to get Clearwater to do th things because yeah. I'm a Clearwater resident. We have St. Pete residents. <coughs> um, should we, if we're not sort of getting where we want to go with our with our community, should we check with Forward Pinellas and 
Yeah, get some perspective. Yes, <clears throat> um, and I also <laughs> believe that planning in here in Pinellas County and the Tampa Bay area generally, it's it's about relationships. And I think what's in, what I've tried to do in the time I've been here is to cultivate productive relationships with my planning colleagues and counterparts. And I have a good relationship with the planning staff in Clearwater. And perhaps what we can do is a follow up to uh, when you and Bob came and talked to the to our Plans Advisory Committee, is to have a you know, another agenda item to talk more about this, to, to sort of nudge them along into um, considering amending their code to incorporate some of these uh, standards. I, I think it's doable, uh, but it'll have to be an iterative process, and we'll just have to. Um, sort of keep you involved as to our progress on how we're moving forward. I think what you're doing with this, the Star Award is a, a really good first step. I saw you have other candidates um, to consider today. And probably what I'll do is I'd probably like to use some of those examples as sort of ammunition. <laughs> and kind of say, this is why you should be a your coach, because you'll end up with these sorts of things and a lot of benefits to, to site planning in this fashion. and. Um, Honestly, amending your, your code and your standards isn't that difficult. Uh, so I think there we could, we could move things along. Um, if I can say, you know, it's my privilege to serve on the Citizens Committee for Forward Pinellas, and I bring the track. There are also folks there that advocate for bicycles. We see the next level down. We see the presentation of what actual things are going on. There are open seats available on the Citizens Committee for Forward Pinellas. They meet once a month and want need folks from different parts of the county and the like, and advocates for the disabled. It would be fantastic folks talking about curb cuts and the like. Right. It would be great to get some more participation, but also that the actual committees, the one that have the councilmen and the mayors that sit on them, are all on uh, cable TV or YouTube, <coughs> just like the PSTA meetings. The Forward Pinellas meetings are out there, so you can be seeing that information and then each of them have these working groups. I mean, this thing is all fantastic. I keep coming back here, and in one minute, I say, we talked about this, we talked about this. There's no way for you guys to know how much detail is underneath it, and this is fantastic. You've essentially read the menu of the restaurant. I go to the meetings and get to read, essentially, the recipes, but I know those represent hours and hours of details that are fantastic. I wish I had more time just to know what you guys are doing. I mean, at that level. It's very inspiring. Any other comments from all of you? I mean, was there anything in particular that, that really <coughs> struck you in, in what you saw? I mean, this is this is very interesting to me. It's just like you're saying, too. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And if you don't mind, what I probably would like to do is as we move through the Bicycle Pedestrian Master Plan development and we develop these technic this technical guidance on accessibility, I'd like to at least share some of that information with you, get your feedback on it, because I'm curious about your perspective on what's a good pedestrian treatment? <clears throat> because you can require it, but it takes many forms if you're general. So I've seen some where it's just thermoplastic, you know, and yeah. it doesn't look very safe to me. Yeah. Because it, it doesn't really stand out from other surfaces that are in the parking lot, you know, things like that. So uh, I think you'll be seeing me in a few months just so I can get your input on, you know, what, are, what would be a quality pedestrian treatment uh, okay. that we include in the plan. Yeah, I would appreciate that. The more you come back, you'll never see a room full of more tra transit user yes. interested advocates. Yeah, we are a bunch of transit users. I, I know in the town I grew up in, when you talk about the long range, we went from, as a kid, from three-foot sidewalks to four-foot sidewalks as the standard, and it took them almost 15 years to cycle through making people replace their front walks. Mm -hmm. And and so it is a long-term gain. Uh, to, and now, of course, they're all four-foot sidewalks. So when we did this, what I'm realizing today for the first time is every place that I've said that place should get a Star Award has been built in the last eight years. Mm -hmm. And so they're really almost adhering to the rules, but we're so surprised that someone did something <laughs> that we want to like give them a cake, right. you know, give them, a, give them an award. Let's hope that that becomes the norm, that people are going to go like, well, of course it did. 
you know, when I came here and why I asked about D, it was so common to have a beautiful sidewalk right next to a six lane road, followed by what I used to call the moat, a giant set of bushes, a large water retention pond, and then the store. And you'd think, well, I got off the bus, I gotta walk down and around and into, into a dangerous uh, a car, car passage passing. to get to the Walgreen or the Walmart. And now we're seeing those, at yeah. least that access. Okay. That, you, you said something that, that was one of the questions I did have. Some of the ones that we've recommended uh, involve Walmart, and I found that most Walmart stores are really very good with having pedestrian no. access. And I'm wondering if there, and some of the drug stores as well, are there, do you find some retailers that are more receptive to this type <laughs> of thing? It's work? funny you mentioned Walgreens because uh, probably the biggest debate we had for, we had a site on alternate 19 that was at a corner that was down the street from Walgreens and CVS wanted to go there badly. But we had certain design standards, so we wouldn't allow two rows of parking in front of the building. The building had to come front to the street. The, the drive through that they wanted to have had to be tucked around the back of the building. And they met with us <laughs> probably for six months trying to get around those requirements. And finally we said, go talk to the, the commission. So if you can convince them that they would like this, then we'll see what we can do. But they go to the commission and they said, no, the staff was telling you the right thing. You okay. need to do the <laughs> building great. the way. But the, um, the reality was they never developed that site right. because they said that their formula, their real estate, there's all I can tell you, the behind the scenes stuff. But typically these uh, retailers will have a real estate committee and so they evaluate each expenditure in terms of purchasing land and what the store's gonna look like. And they would just tell us, our real estate committee doesn't think that'll work here. And I would show them, well, you're doing the same thing in Gainesville. It's, you're doing the same thing on, on the East Coast. But CVS at the time was just not willing to make those concessions on the site plan, so we couldn't make it work. I would love if we could find out who some of those retail groups are there, because I, I come out, I was with Eckerd Drugs, and I remember what we used to go through as well. And you know, those, they're people, and if they know that they're, they are serving customers better and transit riders are customers, yeah. you know, I, I think that, that their management too, just like the, you're always convincing people of this makes sense, mm -hmm. I think ultimately they, they can understand yes. that people like us buy drugs too. And yes. <laughs> I love that that picture you put up with the flow chart because that's the definition of red tape when a developer says ah, this damn city makes us run through this red tape I'm trying to build my store and yeah, yeah. however the goal from our side is to make that simpler yes. by giving them hard rules hey a four-foot sidewalk a three-foot easement yeah. a, a pedestrian access a yeah. painted path. And I would I would tell folks no red tape, we're just yeah. always follow them. I would tell folks, we're transparent. So all right. you do is hit these 27 items and you'll sail through. There's no red tape at all. Yeah. Okay. Just the rules, follow them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're gonna move forward with our agenda. Um, and uh, the first item would be public comment and I don't see any public to make comment. Uh, the next would be my chair report, and I really didn't have anything that much to report from the board meeting. The one thing that when I went back and, and listened to it, you know, some of the, they approved some of the things that we had already talked about. There was an approval on the millage rate, there was approval on the budget. But the one thing that I thought was really interesting was uh, on the the notes about the uh, T. Barda that, uh, that uh, Brad spoke about the fact that there's a new executive director uh, for T. Barda, which would probably be. I would hope very helpful for the whole regional transit concept that we've talked about. And so that, that person is supposed to start on October 26th. So I will, that'll be interesting to know. Um, that's, that's pretty much, I, I mean, there were a number of smaller items, but again, like I always say, if you're interested, go ahead and look at the, uh, uh, go look on the video of, of the board meeting. Um, do you have, because again, we're kind of getting tighter on yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, I'll just give you, I'll give you the bullets. Um, what we did at our meeting was we saw a presentation on complete streets, which was great. Uh, there's a new group being formed across governments to address climate change. Ooh. So all the governments are coming through talking about if we're going to have flooding or the like, and uh, it's just being formed under Tibarda. A great thing, a bicycle advocate 
and they're starting to point it out that when a when a road is detoured, nobody really talks about bicycles. You put arrows and coins, so they're starting to make a movement for that because of the CAC, just like us, just yeah. like Star. Yeah. We're very impressed by that. A discussion about that uh, uh, McMullen Booth extension. That guess who started that one? Oh. And um, I participated in something different, if I can, up at uh, McMullen uh, at Felipe Park. Someone got in trouble about uh, protesting using Roundup around the kids and the like for grass. And so there's now a push to have uh, organic, uh, save the weeds, uh, the grass clippings, instead of bury them, take them to the park and use them as a natural. And so that's the kind of thing the citizens activists, you know, oh, we're, all, yeah. we're all citizens activists. There's a million good things for us to be doing. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, okay. I did. I did. Oh, I did, yes. Oh. Um, okay, then the first action item that we have is the minutes. Have all of you had a chance to look at the minute, minutes from our last meeting? Mm -hmm. Are there any changes, additions? Okay, if not, then I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes as written. I'll take a, make a motion. Okay, and a second? I'll second. Okay, second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes. Amen. Thank you. All right, now our first item, these we're switching on, the, if you look at the agenda, we're going to do, our next item will be, Cassandra is going to talk with us about the automatic passenger count. So this is an action item for you today. Um, we have already brought this to the Finance Committee. Usually we have the Finance Committee and the Planning Committee after you all, um, but because of travel schedules, we had to schedule them last week. Um, so let me just go through a little bit about um, what we're do, what we're planning to do and get and with your um, approval that we'll take to the board uh, to their meeting next week. So as far as what we put on the bus, we have a number of technologies that we have on the bus that are sort of aftermarket um, technologies that do certain things. Some of that is the fare box. Some of that is our uh, automatic vehicle locator. And in this case, we have our automatic passenger counters. So right now we have about 200, 205 buses total, and about 94 of them have these automatic passenger counters. So in, in addition to when, the, um, when you give your fare to the operator and that counts, um, counts you as a passenger, we also have boarding and alighting, or getting on, getting off, information for stops across the county. Um, these have a number of components and can count the number of bikes we can have on the bus, um, as well as how many times the, the operator gets up and, and out of the seat. <coughs> we generally use, uh, we generally collect this information for, like I said, general passengers, wheelchairs, as well as uh, bike usage. And they're used in our planning department and other departments across the agency to determine where are we going to put shelters, how many boardings there are per day, whether we put a shelter there or a bench there, um, maybe route changes, or in the case of uh, the new 52LX, how we would consolidate stops um, or, or have some super stops, again, by the number of passengers that are getting on and, and, and off. It also helps us in the case where we have free ride promotions to count people. So. Um, during during spring break, we had a lot of people trying to get on all at once, and you really just want to get the bus going and stay on time. So having those automatic passenger counters really helps us keep accurate counts. So the the board asks for these this piece of information. Uh, the planning department across uh, you know we use it a lot. Uh, the scheduling department uses it quite often. We get questions from cities and developers about how who's getting on, how many people are getting on, um, and also the people that we partner with who want to know this information. Um, so the challenge that we have with them right now is not they're not on all of our, all of our buses, and that includes they're, they're not on the Jolly Trolleys, they're not on the Looper, um, and it requires that we move those buses around different parts of, uh, of the county in order to get a sampling. Um, but we'd like to go to 100% counts. And so the action item today is to buy a, a large number of APCs. Um, so this would help us keep accurate counts, 
it would be uh, allow us to use these numbers for uh, reporting to the National Transit Database. We use right now we use the fare box, and it also gives us a lot more flexibility with how we move our fleet and manage the fleet around the system. Um, so with this purchase, along with the purchases that we already have planned for new buses, because these systems come on the new buses right now for fiscal year 18 and fiscal year 19. Um, we've also acquired some through, um, through another property, and these came to us free through a transfer of assets program through the Federal Transit Administration. But with another 75 purchased, we could have almost 100% in 2020 and then, and then fill in the gaps later. This would include the Jolly Trolley, it would, include, it would also include the Looper. What this also does is as we retire vehicles, we would then take those off and put them on other vehicles. So we're also, this also involves a rotation. So you say, well, you know, 10 free, 75 that you're buying, 94, that doesn't quite get up to 210 buses, but with that rotation and being able to take the equipment off, we think we can get there pretty quickly. So that is, the request today is to go ahead and buy 75 uh, automatic passenger counters. The money would come from our uh, capital improvement program funding that we get as formula dollars from the Federal Transit Administration that's specifically used for capital projects. Any questions? questions? You looked like you had a question. I was just going to ask how many buses total. Okay. You that. <laughs> okay. Never mind. Uh, I think it's great because I think the more information you have, the more it serves us mm -hmm. in terms of the, us not just asking for it, but approving it. No, that's um, great. Okay. Okay, then I would entertain a motion to approve the recommendations that uh, Cassandra has given to us. A motion, yes. Okay, yeah. Elizabeth. A second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Take back to the board. Thank you. Um, okay, our next item is uh, we we're going to have uh, the Flamingo Fair Agreement. Uh, Mike Hansen and Tressa Zeku. and implementation 
invitation is for regional riders to go to any participating network location, go to the gift rack, pick up the flamingo card, purchase the card, or load money on it. So this solicitation was led by our procurement department at PSPA and our director, Al Burns, uh, but Michael will speak now more about the procurement portion of this solicitation and the fiscal impact. So as the president said, um, Al Burns, our director of procurement, um, led this procurement for the Flamingo Regional Working Group, the five agencies. Um, this request for proposal was released in February 2018, and the proposals were evaluated by an evaluation committee that consisted of um, finance team members from both um, HART and PSDA. Um, the evaluation criteria was based on three different things, staff qualifications, price, um, and retail network service plans um, for a total of 1,000 potential points. Two proposals were submitted by companies um, named Incom and Ready Credit, and Ready Credit scored the highest with 951 points. So Ready Credit has performed this service for several different transit agencies throughout the country, um, including SEPTA out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and TriMet out of Portland, Oregon. And they have a, a pretty extensive retail network in our region. So in our region, um, amongst the five transit agencies, they have approximately 500 retailers, with 175 of those specific to Pinellas County. And some of those retailers include retailers that PSTA currently works with, such as CBS <coughs> and Amscot, as well as other retailers such as Publix um, and 7-Eleven. So the total value of this contract um, is $473,000. Um, but this, this cost isn't going to be borne by just uh, PSTA, it's going to be shared amongst the regional working group. Um, 23,000 of this is for implementation of integrating um, our smart card vendors software with the, the, the retail network. Um, and that cost will be shared with, between PSTA and HART, um, the PSTA share being 11,500 or half the cost. The other $450,000 is um, commissions to be paid or estimated commissions to be paid over the five-year term and what what it is is we're paying four and a half percent commission on all the funds loaded to the smart card so each time someone loads funds to a smart card that retail network will earn four and a half percent and this is actually good news for PSDA because we currently pay a 10 percent commission to CBS and Amscot so this will actually be a cost savings for us and it will open up to other retailers other than just CBS and Amscot and the retailers we work with today. Um, so what we're recommending today is approval of a two-year base term contract with three one-year options with Ready Credit Corporation. I will move that we go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I said I'll, I'll move that we go ahead and proceed. Okay. Well, let's see if there's any questions. If, if, if we do, then yeah. are there any questions? Yeah. So yes. is this still part of the free program, or is this going to be effective when people actually have to start buying a fare? This would be effective when people start buying a fare. Okay. And um, you might be able to answer this question. It's not really pertaining to this, but it does have to pertain to Flamingo. Um, do you have any idea of when we're going to be able to start using the card on a phone or a watch? Uh, Brad put in his email on Friday that um, uh, the president of Apple boarded the subway in Shanghai with his watch, and he said it's coming soon to Pinellas County. Did we define the word soon? Before we all die. So basically, PSDA has chosen open payments. So mm -hmm. Anybody will be able, besides the Flamingo card or the mobile app, they will be able to pay with the credit card, contactless credit card, just like uh, in Costco, for example, you go and you don't swipe it anymore. Right. It's, uh, so, but PSDA has chosen that path in addition to that to have open payments. Mm -hmm. uh, Along with that, you also be able to use Apple Pay and Samsung Pay. Right. I'm just. I guess what I'm kind of asking is, when are we going to have the Flamingo cards available in the Flamingo app? Well, the, the, there will be a Flamingo app, but it will be uh, the the card you have associated with your app mm -hmm. will be a separate card than, than your your plastic. So you right. can't sometimes use a card and sometimes use your phone because no, that will count. It, it, you would have to have two accounts. So yes. when is the Flamingo app going to be up and running to be fully operational? Well, we're currently beta testing the app amongst um, the staff. Okay. Um, I would I would think it would be open probably within a few months to beta test okay. some of the public members that are using the cards now. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And how long is this test? Because uh, we've I've still been using the the one that that he gave us for the test. Is that still are we, are we still testing? Yeah. When does at that this point, we're still testing, and we we would appreciate as many taps. Okay. As so as so, so we were not rolling okay. over to the taping yet. Okay. Not yet. So, yeah. Elizabeth. That answers my question. I accidentally bought a, a paper pass, and then you helpful person got me set up with the flamingo. But I have that, that smart <coughs> card. When, when do I use that before we go 100% using the flamingo card? You have a magnetic stripe ticket that you you have a magnetic stripe ticket. Yes. Okay. Yes. So even after we implement flamingo, uh, PSDA riders will have additional six months to. Okay use or actually one year additional six months okay. to purchase any magnetic stripe mm -hmm. if they choose to but uh, one year to actually use any leftover magnetic Heart. stripe ticket. Mag magnetic. Oh, plenty okay. of time. Good. Well I can't wait till the flamingo. I got my little car here so I'm ready. Any other questions? My, my question is about the regional regionalism. The excitement of flamingo is being able to jump a bus and go to Brandon or to USF or to Newport Ritchie. But why, why is the, is R, RWG different than TBARDA? Or did they have two different purposes or were they closely connected? And then how is it that Hart and PSTA was involved in the evaluation but not Hernando and Sarasota? When we get them, are they well, going to be? Sarasota is. Well, is there, I, I, Sarasota is, but, but, but. They're part of the RWG. Yes, yes. So did but, they just, what, but, Rave, you said that it was the PSTA and Hart employees committee was on the evaluation, the other guys waved and said whatever you you guys handle that we're busy or how did that work so, so basically other agencies are smaller agencies sure. they, they have less staff and uh, sometimes okay. it's hard for them for if there are two people in the office and one person to dedicate a full day because we have been spending tremendous amount of time this is high risk project and a, a lot of time is put into this project and that's the only reason but the invitations are always extended. And that was my guess about the, the PSDA heart, was that we're, we're certainly the big brother in the, in the region. And how is RWG different than TBARDA? Or is one under the other? Are they RWG just is just, just the working group. Yeah. It's just a, oh, it's a committee. It's, it's just a it's, committee. It's, it's, it's the group of the five staff. agencies. Yeah. yeah. So oh, it's it. not like a new agency or anything. We, oh, just, got it. Got it. we just made it up. <laughs> but it's a finance-based group. It's just, no, it's just us. It's just a name so that it's not, a name for the five agencies that are part of Flamingo. Of staff oh, Flamingo. That are getting okay. So it's essentially the Flamingo community. Right, but, but, we, but it was sort of called that, boringly called that, before we knew the Flamingo was Flamingo. Right. Otherwise, now we call the Flamingo Committee. Sure. Okay, great. Yeah. That makes good sense. The, the other one, by the way, we were talking about uh, Sarasota, it, the really th the thing that's unfortunate, and I, you all I think have told me this, is why Manatee isn't part of it because you can't take the bridge to you can, you can't get you can't get to Sarasota without going through Manatee, and Manatee's not part of Flamingo. But I understand it's because of the way that their fare box is. Is that correct? Well, I think they they opted out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they opted out. Oh. Yeah, so they were part of the initial regional working group, and then they they decided to go with a different vendor. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good information. Okay. When do you anticipate this starting? Um, right now, I, I know we originally planned to do some revenue testing in this calendar year. Um, Hart is working within it and with consultants to to update the schedule, and um, we're currently looking out in uh, calendar year 2019. So we will have more information as we get more information from Hart. They don't know. They don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, they're trying to be nice. That's but, hard. you know, it's, it, this has been a very difficult project. It's a, what I have learned from other agencies trying to implement these is that it is difficult for one agency to get through the procurement and the, and the implementation process. And now you've got five agencies trying to do it. So I think it's taken a little more time than we originally expected. Um, the latest time frame that I've heard is mid 2019, like ish. So that means you're, yeah. you're going to wait until March, right? Now. We're, yes, we're. Yeah. I mean, we're we're doing it together. We're going to do it all at once, and that's why the testing. So when the testing goes well, things that advances. When the testing needs a little bit more work from the vendor, 
that espresso calls them up. And she looks, sounds really nice to you, but she <laughs> quite demanding when she needs to be. And so um, please use your flamingo card because the more problems that you uncover with it, the more espresso gets to get her inner self out. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, should, whenever we use yes. the flamingo card and it doesn't work, that's why you have your bag. Well, yeah, but uh, should we report that? I've been keeping a record of all the different times that I use them, yes. what buses they work on, what they absolutely. Oh, yeah. Should I call and tell that to Marianne? Yeah, well, you send an email to Marianne. Marianne will make sure that it gets to the team. And then there's sometimes so. I can swipe it, and I don't think that it worked. The bus driver says it worked on his thing, and it doesn't. A lot of them are on the trolley. Also important, or on the, the Suncoast Beach trolley? But they work a okay, lot good. of times. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Yeah, well, th this yeah. is excellent feedback because these are the things that we need to work out to make sure the system is working 100% toward the end. So, and okay, when he so said, because I, I swiped it again when I got off, I said, well, I just want to see if right. it works. And he's like, well, it worked when you swiped it before because I got out my other pass and I activated okay. my pass. Okay. One but that's why Marianne gives you an extra. The other guy, they usually say it's something. okay. Yeah. But there was one time and a bus driver said, oh no, like that. But he didn't know. It just says, okay. so I activated yeah. the past. <laughs> just a question. It seems like a lot of work for a two year contract. Looks like you're recommending two years. Mm -hmm. So this is just for the retail network. Okay. So the only thing that they're asking for today is approval of this contract to go to this vendor for the detail. So that, you, you know, you go into Publix and you see, you could buy a Chili's gift card, things like that. We're going to be on that. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to be able to go up to okay. customer service and say, can you, can you reload this for me? So that's, that's what the ask is today. Okay. But you're looking at this as a long-term kind of... Card so we want to make, so so when we do these long term agreements and we do it's a two year contract with three one year options yes. is that what it is so if they do a good job in the first two years we renew them we renew them we renew them if they do a lousy job it gives us an opportunity to say you've done a lousy job let's go find somebody else but this is just for the retail part of this is just for the retail part. okay right. yes I got it any other questions. Sue had uh, <laughs> jumped the gun. Sometime back, she said, <laughs> yeah, put the motion, yeah, put the motion on the floor. Uh, a second? A second. A second. Great. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At least having uh, Mike and Espresso come in makes you know that we have, we are moving forward with this. Oh. Right? We keep talking I about it. it. So it does, we do get closer to implementation. We're getting there. Okay, now the last item, the last action item that we have is to about the review and approvals, uh, approvals of, of the uh, Star Award, the latest round of Star Awards that have been proposed. Um, and so Bob Masher is going to stop it. Good afternoon. Everybody at their seat should have copies of the award submittals. I know we were they were sent to you as well. We asked you to look them over. And I'll give you some time today if you need to as well. What we are asking you to do is look through those, and we have another paper there, and we would like you to go through the awards and rank them uh, individually, how you would like them, and then at the bottom decide how many, because this is your award, it's up to you, you think we should be giving out, <coughs> excuse me, this quarter, which could be none, if you don't think any of them qualify, or to all of them. And once you're done with that, Take your time, go through them, we will tally them, and then we'll see how many are awarded. Because if it's, if you, if we'll see how they, they shake out, who thinks the ones are most important, so we'll have that tally, and then if people decide you want two awards or one award, then the top award will get it, the second will get it. We'll, we'll combine those together. We wanted to give you the options. After when we, all. Yeah, when we had real, originally talked about, we've, we've gone back and forth about whether you know, I happen to be one of the people that's on the, the mindset. If somebody's doing it right, I want to give as many <laughs> awards as we can for the, you know, to award them. But but there, you know, there's also some question about whether if there's too many of them. I don't, you know, I don't know. So that's why I um, figured we give everybody some say in that because it's your award. Yeah, because my. Yeah. I voted for 99. <laughs> for 99. 99 awards. So yeah. yeah. Does anybody need? Does everybody have a pen or a writing utensil? If not, we can revive. 
So, you should have put on some Muzak while you were telling. Do, 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 do. Here he is. <laughs> no, not that. <laughs> that makes it pressure filled. <laughs> well, there are there are four recommendations, right? Yes. Yeah. By the way, uh, you should have four boards. We have oh, PNC okay. Bank. Yes, absolutely, Bob. Richard has a question for you. Yes. So, a lot of these are clear who would be getting this award. Um, this one with Walmart. Like, there's there's all these different um, you know companies here. There, there's and then there's like Bob Evans here. It's got a nice. So, well, it's that it's that location. They share the location of that ramp. So it's that particular location, which is uh, what Belcher go today. I'm yeah, wondering. Walmart apparently acquired that corner, and then they 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 developed the corner, but then they sold parcels. And and my understanding is they were still responsible in working with the city of Clearwater in terms of the access, even to those those side locations, the Wawa, the Bob Evans, the uh, you know mm -hmm. the Starbucks there. So who would, who would be awarded this for this specific? My developer? understanding on that one, because I, I submitted that one, was that Walmart, it would really be Walmart who was sort of like the, the oversaw that with the city of Clearwater. So it wasn't Bob Evans per se that, that did the development. They did the development based on the guidelines they got from the city of Clearwater. And so they had, they kind of had to do it, but but Walmart was the one who worked also with it. And the, the employee who worked closely with it, most closely with this project is Bennett Elbow. Is, a, a, is that it? Yeah, Bennett Elbow. He would be the one that we would bring in too, because that this was his his project. And so we did contact like, the city and ask who was responsible, most responsible for working with it. Okay, so that's so this is like a joint between. Right. Yeah, we would want him. And, and if we take it, yeah, if we take it to the city uh, so council at their meeting, PNC we want Bank. both of them there to honor. Yeah, PNC, PNC was only PNC that did it. They did it because I asked them Should to do they it. Get extra points for that? that was amazing mm -hmm. to me. That was um, kind of like, that was just something they did. They just did out of kindness. That's awesome. And that's pretty amazing. And so the rest of them were just done based off the code? They had to do it? I believe well, Elizabeth's was a request. Elizabeth's was a request. Uh, yeah, I got request. stuck in the, what do you call it, the gully? <laughs> Swale. I'm not sure, yeah. yeah, right. Swale. <laughs> um, I got stuck, so I had my cell phone. I called City Hall, and they came right out, you know, with their truck. They got me unstuck. A couple weeks later, maybe a week, two weeks, they put the ramps in. Now I go back and forth to catch bus 62, right on 78th Avenue, between 66th and Belcher. Getting stuck, that's what did it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. Yeah. Well, we we, well, we yeah. always say we have the canaries in the coal mine. Right. That's true. Because we really well, don't I have guess, I, guess yeah. um, I don't like that analogy. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, canaries uh, die first. Well, it's, we it's bad enough as a pedestrian having to walk up one of these uh, uh, car access aprons. But to do it in a wheelchair right. is, is just, I, mean, yeah. I, at least, right. I have an opportunity to right. read one in the grass or something. Does he want folks to fill this out and yes. hand them back to you? And yes. Can you fill these out and we'll collect them? Anyone complete? Juan and Nicole will give us a hand uh, tally. Thank you. I know we could have asked for hands, but I like, sometimes I can intimidate people, so I like the people to be able to write down their own. <clears throat> Anyone forced into group thing. <laughs> well, Rodney left. I have a I have a story for you. Okay. In Anyone 2006. Else? We're good. Anybody else? 2006. I was at my first. It was the old. May have been a pedestrian advisory committee to the MPO, huh. and they had some people in from Clearwater, and they were talking about pedestrian access. And one of the presenters, some guy, I don't know who he is, don't remember him, actually had the temerity to say, oh yeah, Clearwater Mall is considered pedestrian friendly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You, yes, if there had been Ron Tomatoes in the room, they would have been <laughs> fine. Yeah, I, know. I, know. I know. I don't know who he was, but I'm glad I haven't seen him since. Yeah, that was cool. Definitely old school. Do you remember him? I, yeah, I, that, because yeah, that's the one closest to my house. We use a lot of, and there's nothing pedestrian friendly about that, in my opinion. Um, one thing I wanted to say as they're looking at the, the voting on this, um, 
you know, I, I'm going to be terming out on this, obviously, after next, the next meeting will be the last. And I, you know, I hope that you all keep looking for, you know, ones that you can recommend for this, because this is such a, a, you know, like, you know, you even heard Rodney say, you know, um, that, you know, this is, they are even seeing this as a wonderful thing that we're, we're doing these awards. Thank you, Cassandra, because she was the one that pulled me back from wanting to go, and, you know, bang on doors and stuff, and that the awards are really a good way to, to move forward. So, um, you know, I, you know, I hope that every time you have lots of them to evaluate, yes. you know, and, and so I, I keep asking all of you to you know, keep looking for, for sites that, that would be good candidates for, for other Star Awards. I want to uh, update the committee on what we've been doing to promote it. When we have staff going out to meet with groups, making presentations and planning, uh, we've got them going out talking about shelters or the Bicycle Advisory Committee in St. Pete. We ask them, please include this. Let them know about it. When I go out, uh, I go to a lot of the chamber meetings with economic development and government, and all of any time I'm in them, I let them know about it as well. Say, hey, pass this along. These are great things that your people can do. So we're asking pretty much anyone who's giving any sort of outreach or presentation to let people know about these awards. And I know Gloria's been making the rounds too. Um, in fact, you, you've got Clearwater, City of Clearwater coming up. November 1st, I'm going to okay. be presenting to the City of Clearwater. So depending on what, you know, what you all would like to approve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. right. We may be able to, if, if uh, some of the Clearwater ones win today, too, then we, we can present those. Yeah. And, uh, oh, and we have uh, a couple of the groups a uh, few of the people, oh, uh, I can't remember her name right now, the lady I met at the Big C, who we've been in touch with. She's an uh, advocate for persons with disabilities throughout the county, as well as the one who heads that, that project down in the city of St. Petersburg. They're helping as well. Oh, the Cappy? Okay. Yeah. Cappy, yeah. Linda yeah. Cappy. yeah. I'm sorry? Linda or Need a driver? Linda Cappy. 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 Happy. And then the, the, the other per the person that heads the county uh, disability thing is oh, Jody Armstrong. That's it, Jody. Armstrong. That's, yeah. I couldn't think yeah. of her name. Yeah, I, I just I was just talking with her, and she's like very very psyched about this as well. Yeah. And I want to get to the uh, area agency on aging as well. Yes, because that's very important. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because this this affects you know lots of seniors no longer drive and and they you know. Yes, they can use care ride, but some of them choose to use fixed route buses as well, and that's, this is very important. By the way, if you don't remember, this came up recently, and this was going back to uh, input we got from um, ARP when we were doing green light. It's two to four times as expensive to have a senior move into assisted living than to be able to keep them in their home. And the top reason is lack of mobility. Lose the ability to drive because, according to AAA, most of us will outlive our ability to safely drive by 10 years. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that's it's always good to keep in your pocket. All right. <laughs> All right. So, as far as the number one tally, and we ranked these in order of one for the most important to four for the least, though, a number one that got the most votes was PNC Bank. But there was four, yeah, four people said PNC Bank should be uh, number one. The um, next two were both the Walmart and the Pinellas Park Public Works were both ranked by three people as number one, each ranked by three people as number one, and then Publix got two votes for the number one spot. And then the number two spot, um, four people had Walmart as number two, <coughs> and then PNC Bank and Pinellas Park Public Works each had three folks that voted at number two, and then Publix came in last, last again. And, and then um, most people said four. Yeah. So we're looking at five people said four. So we're looking at PNC Bank, Walmart number two, Pinellas Park Public Works three, and Publix mm -hmm. four. Okay. Yep. And what about the how many? Four. Uh, four awards should be given out this quarter. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> well, that makes it easy. Yeah. So, <laughs> they're all there. I said five. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I would, I would like that too. Um, so do we need to vote on this or is it basically that that, that is the vote? No, only, is that the vote? Uh, only they have to, for the rules. 
accepted only voting, voting members can, can vote. Yeah, you have a motion to accept all four as a award. Okay, all right. Well, then, yeah, can I have a motion to accept all four of those as the winners? Yes. Elizabeth, okay. And the second? second. Teresa, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Opposed? All right. All right. All right. We have Three. four winners. We'll be we'll moving, moving well, forward to set up some meetings and give these out at the city councils and elsewhere. Yeah, I was just going to say, here's my question. Do you want me to do the Clearwater, uh, the, two, the two big ones for Clearwater, uh, when I present this program to the City Council of Clearwater on the 1st of November? Uh, I think it's a perfect opportunity. Yeah. Let's, let's see if we can get the developer in there as well. Yeah. That would be the ideal way to get both. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And then um, I don't know how. Well, I'll see what I can set up for Pinellas Park because we have them and. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. yeah Elizabeth, uh, can you present that? Yeah. I'm hoping. Yeah, because she was, she was so instrumental in making this yeah. happen. And where's the other, uh, are they, do we have three Clearwaters? Well, PNC is in Clearwater, but Clearwater had nothing to do with it. It was PNC doing it of their own. I mean, Clearwater okay. should, should know how wonderful PNC was in doing it, but PNC deserves the credit. Okay. Well, it's almost like we should ask PNC where they'd like to receive it, whether right. at the Chamber of Commerce it, or at, a, at the yeah. city. Uh, wherever yeah, they would like, idea. we'll, we'll yeah. come meet you there and give it to you in front of whoever you want at your annual yeah. conference, wherever you want it. You know, you pick. You pick. Hawaii. I think Hawaii. Well, we're we're trying to trim a little off the budget next year, so I think I just cut out Hawaii. I'll go. I'll go on point. All right. Well, thank you. We'll, we'll get to work on these, and I'll keep you updated. Thank you, everybody. This is we're moving forward. Thank you. That's great. Okay. A um, couple other things on the agenda. Um, yeah, first, oh, member of comments. Do you have any comments? By I have a question and a comment. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my first question, because we brought up, was N about NCAT. Um, is it possible to work with them to get them a stop at Grand Central? Because for people who are riding PSD and have to merge onto NCAT, they have to do it at a corner, a very unsafe corner in St. Petersburg. Yeah, their, their goal is to get to the hospital, but we could talk to them about their about change. The only reason I asked that is because one day I was at the mall, Tyrone mm -hmm. Mall, and I said, okay, Siri, give me directions home. And it gave me directions on MCAT home. And I was like, can't do it because first off, they're not Flamingo. They don't take our fare card. Right. And then I was like, yeah, and then it shows you how you want to do to transfer to 34 at the corner of Fifth Avenue South, which is South St. Pete is not the most ideal place to transfer from MCAT to PSTA. So I was just trying to think if we could work with them to possibly make it a little bit easier, especially for veterans coming out of the VA, if they need to connect right. with us, or people coming up from Bradenton who work in St. Pete and need to transfer to PSTA to get to work. Hmm. You want to call Bill? Yep. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to share was around the way here, I got a post on Facebook. Um, the clear the Cross Bay Ferry is going to be starting again on November 1st. They're going to have expanded hours, and they give out their prices. Um, it'll be $8 for an adult, $3 for children, and discounts for seniors and retired and active military. Um, it'll still be the same place. It'll pick up in downtown St. Pete at the Vinoy Basin, which connects, obviously, with the Looper, um, the Central Avenue Trolley, and obviously, in the future, um, the bus rapid transit down First Avenue North. And then over in, Saint, in Tampa, the drop-off has changed. It will now be at the Florida Aquarium. And you will then be able to connect to the trolley, which is now free. Right. The so Tampa can, trolley is now free. The trolley is now free in Tampa. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to add was that uh, late hours will be later. The last one leaving Tampa will leave at 10 p.m. Or I'm sorry, I stand corrected. The last one leaving St. Petersburg will leave at 10 p.m. The last one leaving Tampa will leave at 11 p.m. So that way you can go to a hockey game. Oh. <laughs> if you like hockey, like someone who has hockey on all of their devices. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Thank you. Thank you Monica. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. I have a question. Is uh the is the fair going to be waived on election day? Provides to the polls? Yeah. I think historically it is. I saw you. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. I thought so. Share, share, share. The, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Share, share, share is a good, good point. That may, again, a good chance to remind but people. Salt to, to the polls, right? There we go. Salt okay. to the polls. Salt to the polls. That's cool. Okay. Any other questions? Well, crossovers and I did a presentation uh, last month 
committee to advocate for persons with impairments for the city of St. Petersburg on PCA's new mobility on demand. Program. Oh yes, that's right, you did. She's a state presenter. It's my, is awesome. It's flexible and responsive. You can go almost to almost any destination within Pinellas County within the same day. Okay, right now with the DART program, you have to make your reservation by 5 p.m. the day before. So, and also, Ross and I worked the worked a career and college fair at Pinellas Park High School last Wednesday to promote the DART and transportation disadvantage program. Transportation disadvantage is awesome. It's for people that are 150% below poverty and provides them transportation. Yay, PSDA! Yeah, I agree, I agree. And the advocate a lot of times for the transportation disadvantaged on the board is Patty Johnson too, and she is just like, just like you. Who, I'm just so enthusiastic about the yes, value of is. doing this. Uh, I mean, it, it, I mean, it makes all of us want to, you know, want to be involved. I mean, she's, she's that. Yeah. It's, it's a really good example of it, how enthusiasm is contagious. Patty and I worked worked a holiday luncheon together. So ah, she's, yeah, she's terrific. So, okay. Um, just a couple other quick notes, um, and that is that next month at our meeting will be the elections for next year's officers, and we also have several uh, new members who have been approved to to join the track. They have been invited to attend the next meeting. They can't come or vote or anything like that, but they, they can come and see what's going on. I think some of you, that whoever was new this, for this year, some of you were invited last, last year to come. So, um, so there will be new members and that'll be wonderful. Always like, uh, fresh perspectives. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? I, yes. I brought this up before. I would, I would love for us to develop a logo for track even if it's just the PSTA with TRAC written in it or something, I don't know who does that kind of stuff, if we could kick it around. I personally have taken my business card and flipped it over and said, would you like to volunteer for the track committee? So when I pass it out on the bus, folks automatically have the URL, but just writing TRAC is so bizarre, it would be neat if we had a little track logo and it's something we could kick around with someone. Someone here must be a graphic artist at PSTA. And it's the kind of thing that would, would you know, it's the kind of thing you do in your lunch hour, and, and we would run it by the committee, and then maybe it's a maybe it's a dead duck, or maybe it would catch on fire. But huh. just yakking about it isn't going to get it anywhere. If I could meet with someone who does that and try it and see if it was worth it, well, at least I'd have a neat neat business card with two sides on it. You know, or even if you just had a card that had the transit riders advisory committee and the phone numbers to contact, because I know the same thing. I've had that when I've been talking with yeah. about things. I always ask other riders, well, why do you ride, or things like that. And people have said, well, that sounds interesting. I could just hand them one of those cards, or you all could hand them one of those cards. And says, you know, call Mary Ann <laughs> or, or someone. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we're happy, to make, we're happy to make some cards for you. Yeah, that's Yeah, we've had them made in the past. Yes, yes, we have. Oh, 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 yes. Yeah. Here's the other thing. Yes, this is, uh, this is uh, Clearwater, uh, the citywide Complete Streets Workshop. Mm -hmm. They are going for any of you who are uh, within Clearwater. Uh, on the 22nd, uh, there's going to be a, a meeting at the Ross Norton Recreation Center uh, about citywide complete streets for Clearwater, or the alternate is on the 23rd at the Countryside Library on, on Table Springs. So if, if any of you can attend and, and uh, you know, are, are interested in doing that, uh, I will be going to the one at the uh, Ross Norton Recreation Center. St. Pete is a big leader in this. Dunedin is doing a thing on it, and so it's great. I know they've been working on this for a while with Drew Street. Yeah, yeah Drew great. Street has been the big, the big focus. So it's on great it. to see yeah. folks adopting this. It's great. Well, and again, I, it, it's interesting because uh, how many of us are involved with other things in our communities because as, as transit riders, we we do. We see what's going on very up, up close and personal. Yay, so, team! <laughs> yay, team! That's right. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I will adjourn the meeting. Our next meeting is on November 13th. Our last meeting for real. The last meeting for, oh yeah, yours and my last meeting for, at least for now, unless we sign up for the following year. So, well, thank you everyone. See you in November.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the first thing I said is I, I, I first said it was a comment.